then this is um, for AQA Psychology and this is so Social Psychological Theories of Aggression and we're looking at de-individuation um, and this is the third social psychological theory we've looked at um, and what this is is um, where you're when you're in a large group basically the idea is that because you're anonymous you're much more likely to engage in aggressive behavior here's Zimbardo's definition being in a large group provides people with a cloak of anonymity that removes personal responsibility for the consequences of their actions. It causes behaviour to become impulsive, irrational and disinhibited because it is not under the usual social and personal controls. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means. But basically when you're anonymous you don't take responsibility for your actions in the same way because there won't be the same consequences or you feel there won't be the same consequences. Um, so it, we're, because other people can't judge us negatively, social norms don't then inhibit our behaviour. In normal situations there are various social norms that apply which mean that we act in a civilised manner, um, we don't go around recklessly being aggressive or destructive because we know there'll be consequences um, both in terms of uh, our reputation, social aspects and also punishment as well. Um, we, we lose our sense of uh, our sense of self-identity and our sense of responsibility for our behaviour when we're in a crowd which adds to this whole thing we have less personal guilt about our actions because we're in a, a group of large people not a group of large people a large group of people um, we uh, therefore because everyone is um, being aggressive we assume responsibility is shared with people around us so then we take less we feel less personal guilt about what is happening and um, because we're not acting as an as an individual we're acting as a group so we assume that the guilt is also shared as a group um we talked about impulsive irrational disinhibited behavior here's just some some different words that could describe that so what you would expect to see is things like emotional um behavior that's not rational irrational um impulsive so spur of the moment disinhibited um, it, you're not being inhibited or holding back your behavior uh, aggressive living in the moment ignoring social norms all those sorts of things are what leads to aggression in a crowd uh, that's kind of what we mean by disinhibited behavior um, and here are some conditions that promote the individuation things like darkness, drugs, alcohol, uniforms, masks, disguises. If you think particularly about um, things like the London riots um, in 2011, um, you had, um, the, they happened at night when it was dark, people involved were often under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Um, things like um, masks and disguises promote the idea that you're anonymous and so that means you're much more likely to be in a state of de-individuation. Okay, so those are some conditions that apply. Normally, our behaviour is inhibited because of social norms, because we're easily identifiable. We're aware of both our, our public behaviour, so we don't want to be judged by other people, but we're also self-critical about our own behaviour, um, and we hold ourselves to standards of behaviour normally. So that's why our behaviour is usually more inhibited when we're not anonymous. Right, looking at some research then, um, this is the first piece we're going to look at, which was by someone called David Dodd, who was a, um, a, a teacher at a university. And he asked um, a number of undergraduate students this question, if you could be totally invisible for 24 hours and were completely assured that you would not be detected or held responsible for your actions, what would you do? And he kept these responses anonymous. And he got other people to sort out the, the different responses that they'd given in. They'd written responses on a different piece of paper. So he got independent people to sort these responses into different groups. And the results were that 36% of responses, so a, a third of people, um, were going to do something antisocial. 26, so one in four of those, were actual criminal acts, like robbing a bank, or even going as far as murdering a political figure. But only 9% of the responses were pro-social, i.e. helping other people. 
Um, so this suggests that the link between, because that question was you will be completely anonymous and there won't be any consequences, that there's a link between that and that high percentage of people that said they would take part in antisocial behaviour, um, aggressive acts. Right, so there's several different studies that um, we look at here. Dodd is the first one we've talked about. Zimbardo, um, this is the picture on the right here, uh, is Zimbardo, an experiment that he carried out where he um, got people to g deliver electric shocks to uh, another person who was a learner, kind of a bit like Milgram's study. Um, and those who were dressed like this in this picture um, were twice as likely to give a shock um, and they were also uh, twice as they would hold it down for twice as long so they were more likely to press the button that they believed would give a shock to someone else and they would hold it down for twice as long compared to another group where they were like seated around a table they had big name tags um, it was really obvious that they were not anonymous so in that case it was much less likely that they would deliver an electric shock to not not a real electric shock, but they believed they were giving one, I think Milgram. Um, Zimbardo's prison study, which you already know about, supports this theory because um, the prison guards were de-individuated, de they had those um, uh, mirrored sunglasses on, um, they were acting as a group of guards and they became aggressive with the prisoners. And then there's this really interesting study called um, Deviance in the Dark by someone called Gergen. And if you Google this, there's a great cartoon that comes up um, that goes through this whole study. I'd really recommend it. Um, but uh, basically what happens is he put eight people together in a padded room and made it complete darkness. It was four males, four females, complete darkness in the room and told them that they wouldn't be introduced to anyone after the hour was up. No one would know who they were. So made them completely anonymous for the hour and basically watched to see what would happen um, in this total pitch blackness. Basically, rather than them becoming aggressive, which is what de-individuation would suggest, actually they became really intimate with each other. Um, it, and this is, they, he compared it to another group of people, eight people, who sat in the same room but with um, full lights on and they ha kind of introduced themselves to each other and so on. And this was for an hour. And it was the group in complete darkness. They didn't become aggressive, but they became, they started kissing each other and um, touching each other and so on. So it, it produced, rather than producing aggression, it produced intimacy. So that suggests that it's p perhaps there's something else in the um, in the situation that's pr in. If you think of Zimbardo's experiment here, there might be something else in the situation that's promoting aggressive behaviour compared to maybe something in Gergen's study is promoting intimate behaviour. Suggests that there's some kind of other cue, perhaps working behind the scenes here, that we've got completely contradictory results here. The last piece of research was Cannavale, um, and he um, did quite a lot of research on this, but one of the things that he found was that male and female groups responded differently to de-individuated conditions, and it was only the male groups that became aggressive. So that's really important because it tells us that we need to look at male and female groups differently and understand how the, how gender applies to this theory. You know, it perhaps could suggest that biological theories might be good in this situation. You know, it, it could explain why there's a difference between male and female, which this social theory can't really. Um, and then looking a little bit further about aggression, um, and about for our evaluation, sorry, um, another thing to consider is self-awareness. So in 1970, this theory was extended, not, not just to include anonymity as the key factor, but actually to discuss whether self-awareness is more important. So normally we're aware of ourselves and we regulate our behaviour. But in a crowd, we look outwards to everything that's going on around us. We almost have like a sensory overload because there's so many people and noise and different things going on. And actually that reduces our awareness of ourselves. And then that's what leads to aggression. We have um, private self-awareness. Um, in a crowd, that's diminished because we're not paying attention to our own feelings and behaviours. But we also uh, have public self-awareness, which is about what other people think of us. But because we're anonymous, we're not 
being going to be judged and we're not going to be held accountable. So both types of self-awareness are reduced. And that's a big um, kind of criticism that's been made of the theory that actually it's not as much to do with anonymity as, as to do with self-awareness and that that's a really important part that's sort of been omitted from the theory that lowered self-awareness is really what leads to de-individuation. Um, and then the last evaluation point to note is that this has really important real life implications. So if you know that anonymity is what leads to aggression, um, that's um, important for crowd control um, at protests and uh, football matches and so on. Um, so here are some suggestions. You can do things like placing mirrors around the walls of stadiums so that people can see themselves behaving violently um, and that should increase their self-awareness um, equally you can make it clear by prosecuting crowd members using CCTV footage after the fact you can make it really clear that um, people who participate in crowd riots are not actually anonymous in this day of CCTV even though they think they are and that should hopefully increase self-awareness um, and reduce that sense of anonymity um, and actually that happened with um, things like Charlie Gilmore, if you're aware of that, there was a very public arrest and jail sentence for someone who participated in student riots. Um, and it was widely discussed whether they were making an example. Um, the last point um, here, reduce alcohol consumption since it reduces self-awareness. So that's another thing which could have a positive impact on reducing aggression in crowds. So lots and lots of different um, real life implications there, positive implications which could help reduce aggression.